Good afternoon, and welcome to this January series presentation. We're so delighted that you're here. We'd like you to take a moment and turn off cell phones or anything else that makes noise. Just a moment. And then let's pray together. Beautiful Savior, Lord of creation, we praise you for this day. We praise you for the beauty outside, and now especially for the beauty inside, the delight of an auditorium filled with people who want to learn more about your world. We praise you for this and for the complexity of this world, for giving us puzzles and clues, for giving us curiosity and wonder, for giving us signs of you in everything that we see. Help us to have the eyes to see. Thank you for making so much available to our understanding. Thank you for instrumentation and precision, for knowledge through time, and for recent discoveries. We praise you for colleges where questions have been asked and research has happened through the ages. And we praise you for professors. Today we thank you for Deb and Lauren Harsma, for giving them committed hearts curious and able minds, and devoted lives. Bless them, bless us all, as we think together about your glory, as it's revealed to us in the wonder of the world around us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. And now Professor Dan Harlow will introduce our speakers. Welcome. I'm honored to introduce two dear friends and colleagues from the Department of Physics and Astronomy here at Calvin College. Deborah and Lauren Harzma exemplify better than anyone I know at Calvin how to go about the business of integrating faith and learning. Deborah Harzma is an astronomer who studies galaxy clusters and the universe as a whole by observing radio wavelengths. Most of her research has focused on gravitational lensing, a phenomenon of general relativity in which light is bent by gravitational fields. Lauren Harzma is a physicist who studies the electrical activity of nerve cells. He recently received a grant from the National Science Foundation to set up an electrophysiology lab at Calvin College where he has supervised a variety of projects. A gifted pianist, Deborah grew up in the Evangelical Free Church. She graduated from Bethel College in St. Paul, Minnesota uh, with degrees in physics and music and earned her PhD at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Before joining the Calvin College faculty, she did postdoctoral research in the astronomy department at Haverford College in Pennsylvania. Lauren grew up in the Christian Reformed Church graduated from Calvin College with a double major in physics and math. He pursued his doctoral study at Harvard University and before returning to Calvin, did postdoctoral work in the neuroscience departments at Tufts University and the University of Pennsylvania. To their delight and to our good fortune, Deborah and Lauren met each other uh, in a Bible fellowship back in 1992 when they were doctoral students in Cambridge, Mass. And in his sovereignty, God saw to it that their subatomic particles were attracted to each other. Uh, the result of that attraction was not only their marriage, but a very fruitful uh, professional collaboration of an area of interest to them, the intersection of science and faith. Over the past decade, they have lectured together on this topic at numerous conferences and colleges and churches. And together they have written and published recently a book titled Origins, A Reformed Look at Creation, Design, and Evolution. As a biblical scholar and Christian layperson interested in the sciences, I have found this book immensely helpful. I commend it to you. It forms the basis of their talk today. Uh, and is available for purchase, not only in our campus bookstore, but in the west lobby of this building. Uh, 
where the authors would like to meet and greet you and sign your copy of the book uh, following their presentation. Calvin College is grateful to Peter C. Cook for underwriting today's presentation. And now please join me in welcoming Professors Deborah and Lauren Harzma. Thank you, Dan, for that introduction. Yes, the subatomic attraction. We're honored to speak today in this prestigious lecture series. I'll be doing the first part of the talk today, and Lauren will do the big middle section, and I'll come back and wrap up at the end. Uh, you may have expected us to speak every other word or finish each other's sentences, uh, but we decided to only do that at home. Um, quite a few people have asked us what it's like to write a book together, and we say it's a lot easier than remodeling the house together. Oh. Okay, let me can begin with a few caveats. Many of our colleagues on campus, including Dan Harlow and many others, more than I can name, uh, write and speak on origins issues, and we're honored to represent them today. We come to these issues as experts in astrophysics and biophysics, but we've learned a lot over the years from biologists, geologists, uh, theologians, biblical scholars, and philosophers. So we see part of our calling as Christian scholars to report back to the church what we have learned and what's being discovered in all those disciplines. We assume today that most of you in the audience are Christians or familiar with Christianity, uh, but we hope the talk will be helpful to anyone wanting to understand better how Christians deal with these issues. Creation and evolution is not the only science issue facing the church today, despite all the attention it gets. We don't even feel it's the most important one, and we just wrote a book on it. Other issues like bioethics, AIDS, and the environment are much more urgent, but those are being addressed elsewhere in the January series this year and years past. Today, our goal is to summarize for you the scientific and religious issues around origins, including evolution and human origins, which are some of the most thorny of those issues. 150 years ago this month, Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. The theory of evolution quickly became a battleground for competing religious claims, and it still is. Often Christian young people are caught in the middle. Many of them want to pursue careers in science and hold to their faith at the same time, but they're unsure how to do that. So consider the story of a college student named Jennifer. Jennifer and the other characters are fictitious. Jennifer grew up in a Christian home. During her teenage years, she made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ. Her parents, her pastor, her youth group leaders encouraged her in her studies and to enroll at a nearby university. But they warned her that atheists at the university would try to uh, convince her that God doesn't exist using the Big Bang and evolution. Her church showed a video that defended creationism and argued that evolution can't happen. So during her first semester at the university, uh, Jennifer joins a Christian fellowship group, and there she meets Professor Walker. Walker's a Christian, a faculty mentor to the group who encourages the students to keep their faith active during college with prayer and Bible study and church involvement. He's also a successful scientist who studies disease-causing bacteria. In part because of his inspiration, Jennifer decides to become a doctor. She signs up for his biology course, and on the first day, she notices that the textbook assumes the theory of evolution is true. And as the semester goes on, Professor Walker says things in class that suggest he actually believes evolution. So finally, Jennifer goes to his office to ask him about it. Professor Walker takes time to talk with her and carefully explains his view that a great deal of scientific evidence supports evolution and that it's okay to believe that God used evolution to create the species. When Jennifer leaves his office, her head is spinning. This is the first time she's heard anything like this. Jennifer respected Professor Walker. She'd seen his faith in action. But if he was right, then her parents, pastor, and youth group leaders were wrong, and she respected them too. She didn't know what to believe or where to go for answers. Well, these are not easy questions. We'll come back to evolution later, but we'll start today by considering another scientific milestone, even earlier, because it raised some of the similar issues. So 400 years ago this year, Galileo first pointed his telescope at the heavens, and he saw deal details that no one had imagined before. The moon, instead of being perfectly smoothed, had a ridge down, uh, ridged craters that you could see along the shadow line. You could see the shadows, like in this drawing here. He found that Jupiter